Let us take another example, a slightly complicated one. Suppose someone wants to find out whether the occurrence of two diseases, asthma and diabetes, are related or not. To check this, they go to a hospital which has only two kinds of patients, asthma and diabetes. And then they calculate two things. The first is the probability of a general person having asthma. So this is the probability of a general person having asthma. For this, they look at the fraction of people in hospital having asthma. So this is the first quantity which, which they measure. And then the second quantity is probability of a diabetic person having asthma. And again, for that, they go to they go to this particular hospital and calculate fraction of diabetic patients having asthma. To calculate this property. So they calculate these two quantities and they see that probability of a diabetic person having asthma is much less than general person having asthma. I should say chances. So we conclude, it is better to be diabetic if you want to avoid asthma. Continue. This statement is in front of you, what do you think? It should be quite clear to you that the consequence seems unlikely. And uh, as a student of probability, we should be able to figure out what has gone wrong. Why is this conclusion false? So pause the video, think about it and see if you can find out the correct reason why this conclusion is false. So let's see why this conclusion is false. We will see that if we just express everything clearly in terms of our probability framework, we will find the error. So the time to events, A being person having asthma, D being person having diabetes. So what we want to find out is whether probability of A intersection D is equal to probability of A multiplied. The reason why the conclusion is false is because of a simple reason. They did their survey in a hospital and not general population. So what do I mean by that? So let's see what quantities they calculated. The first quantity they calculated was fraction of people having asthma in total number of patients. So that is probability of A not really just probability of A, but probability of A given patient has either asthma or diabetes. Because they are in a hospital, there are only patients there. So this is the quantity which they are calculating. What about the second quantity? They calculated people having asthma and diabetes among diabetic patients. This is probability of A intersection D given diabetes and you can convince yourself that this is also probability of asthma given diabetes. So just to falsify the conclusion we will see that actually if A and B are independent that means they satisfy the condition even then this quantity is going to be less 
then the subject. And that will explain the, uh, the, the conclusion to be false. That will say that why this paradox was appearing. We were supposed to find the relation between A and D, but we are calculating them as this and this quantity, and that will show that why this false, false conjecture has been obtained. We are comparing two quantities. One is probability of A given A union D. This was the first quantity. This was our estimate of fraction of people having asthma. Fraction of people having asthma in general population. The other quantity is probability of A intersection D given D which was also the same as probability of A union D. So this was our estimate of people having asthma when they are also diabetic. This is the general population and this is diabetic population. And in both of these, we are calculating number of people having asthma. And now by law of conditional probability, this is divided by probability of A intersection D and I want to compare it with probability of A given D which is probability of A this follows because A and D are independent. Now this simplifies to probability of A given probability of A union D. This I want to compare with probability of A. And now it is quite clear that this quantity is bigger. So even though A and D were independent, since we looked only at the people having asthma or diabetes, this quantity became bigger. So our estimate of people having asthma in general population was completely Their conclusion was that these two events, A and D, were negatively correlated. They wanted to say that probability of A intersection D is less than probability of A less than probability of D. Though what they measured was in a hospital, so they thought that probability of A intersection D is less than probability of A intersection D probability of D, A union D. So, what we are going to show in the exercise is that even though A and D were independent, they were not negatively correlated, if you only look at the universe as being A union D, they will appear to be negatively correlated. There is again a special case when this could be equality, but in most of the time, this will be negatively correlated and this you will prove as an exercise and again this tells you why the paradox was arising. In the general population it was true that A and D were independent, they were not negatively correlated but if you look at a special population they might seem to be negatively correlated but the truth is not that. This in literature is known as Boxer's paradox. We move to another uh, few definitions. We want to define independence for family of events. So let's assume that instead of having two events, now we have a lot of events. By the way, this notation means this set AI where I belongs to I. So we have, let's say, these sets, then we can tell them to be. So, so we have some set of events and we want to define whether they are independent or not. It turns out that a single definition is not good. So let's look at a few natural definitions. The first natural definition is these family of events being pairwise independent. 
this says that if you look at any of the two events, they are independent. This seems very intuitive. So, a family of events is independent or pairwise independent. If you pick any two events in the family, they are turning out to be independent. They do not relate to each other. Let's look at a slightly stronger definition, which is called mutually independent. So, a family of events is called mutually independent if you pick any subset of the family it turns out to be independent. That means for all subsets J, if I look at this event, that means all the events in the subset family, this is just the multiplication of probability of So in some sense, pairwise independence just forces the independence in, in between any two events. In mutually independence, the criteria of independence is applied to all possible subsets. It is quite clear that if events are mutually independent, then they are pairwise independent. How about the reverse? Intuitively, it seems that if any two events are independent, that means they do not affect each other, then all the events should not affect each other. Again, pause the video and think about it. What do you guess? Are these two equivalent or are they not? It turns out they are not equivalent. And let me show this by an example. That's the best way to show it. Before I show you the example, realize clearly that mutual independence is a much, much stronger criteria. If events are mutually independent, they are definitely pairwise independent. We are asking the opposite question. If the events are pairwise independent, can we say that they are mutually independent or not? So we take a very, very simple case. Again, toss off two coins. Unbiased. Let me define three events for toss of two coins. A is two tosses. We kind of looked at this event before also today. B is first coin toss is head. C is second one is say head. So the question is, are these events independent? Are they pairwise independent? Are they mutually independent? So let's first look at the easier criteria to check, which is pairwise. So what about B and C? It's pretty clear that they are independent. B depends only on the first coin toss. C depends only on the second coin toss. So they are independent. What about A and B? This is something we did today in the class. So we know that they are By the same logic, A and C turn out to be independent. So this implies A and B and C are pairwise independent. Are they mutually independent? So you will show in the assignment of this lecture that they are not. And one intuitive way to check it is if B and C have happened, implies A has definitely happened. Right? So B does not give us any information about A. C does not give us any information about A. B and C individually give no information about A. But together they imply. So in this sense, A and B and C are not mutually independent. We get that pairwise independence need not imply mutual independence.
in the next lecture we will see these concepts even for random variables and show an application in the field of computer science thank you